So greetings to everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this time with Dr. John Philip Newell, one of my favorite authors. And I'm so grateful that he could be with us today um, from Toronto, actually, uh, at this particular moment in time, although he lives in Edinburgh. So um, let me tell you a, a little bit about how this is going to go tonight. And then I wanna introduce uh, our wonderful speaker to you. So. Some of the things about tonight. Uh, first of all, we are going to have a wonderful session with him, but we're going to start with a little bit of a, a prayer, conversation, introductions, these kinds of things. And that's going to go for a little while. You are welcome if you have a comment or you have a question, um, you can put that um, in the chat and we will check it and then you know if, if get to those um, later. But first, we're just going to have kind of a rich conversation about some of these uh, wonderful things about Celtic Christianity and creation and uh, all these uh, beautiful expressions of our faith that um, John Philip is very, very good at um, expressing deep wisdom on. Uh, so towards the end of our time, we will address uh, your questions more fully. And so be thinking um, and feeling as we go through this conversation, uh, what resonates with you? Um, what inspires you to action? Um, what is it that is drawing you in to a deeper relationship with the spirit? Um, and what is sparking in you that golden divine piece of you um, in this particular moment in time? And think of ways that we can share those so that uh, we will edify this moment and one another and really uh, create something beautiful together. Okay. Um, so some things about, uh, and please keep yourself um, just muted uh, and so that we don't have a lot of disruptions in the midst of it. Um, so, but let me tell you a little bit about John Philip Newell. So he is by birth a Canadian, but I said he lives in Edinburgh. Um, and so he's very familiar with this side of the Atlantic, the other side of the Atlantic, and he's gone back and forth and back and forth and also other places in the world and learned and taught um, some of the things that he has learned. Uh, I'm hoping he will share with you tonight uh, interfaith kinds of things, um, East and West. He has so much knowledge to share, but he teaches regularly in the United States and Canada and also leads International Pilgrimage Weeks on Iona in the Western Islands of Scotland. So his PhD is from the University of Edinburgh and he's offered, authored over 15 books, including A New Ancient Harmony, Sounds of the Eternal, The Rebirthing of God, and Listening for the Heartbeat of God, and Sacred Earth, Sacred Soul. Sacred Earth, Sacred Soul is the one that we have hopefully um, read already before we got on here. But if not, please grab that book as soon as possible so that you can learn some more stuff um, from John Philip Newell. Um, Newell speaks of himself as a wandering teacher following the ancient path of many lone teachers before him in the Celtic world, wandering Scots, seeking the well-being of the world. Isn't that fabulous? If only we had more wandering teachers in our lives that are part of our everyday. And perhaps you can think of some as we talk who have been those wandering teachers for you, or maybe you're a wandering teacher for someone else. So um, as we do this thing together, please be aware that there are many books of his that you can uh, read. One of my favorites is a book called Celtic Prayers from Iona. And it's a very simple and beautiful book that you can pray every day. He has it put in, I have all his books. Well, not every single one, I think, but I've got most of his books. And so it looks like this, Celtic Prayers from Iona. Um, and I want to share a prayer that he wrote um, in this uh, for Wednesday. And so the Wednesday prayer, opening prayer and Thanksgiving, it goes like this. You are the love of each living creature, O oh God. You are the warmth of the rising sun. You are the whiteness of the moon at night. 
You are the life of the growing earth. You are the strength of the waves of the sea. Speak to me this night, O God. Speak to me your truth. Dwell with me this night, O God. Dwell with me in love. Amen. So with that, let us um, get into some of this conversation um, by starting with this beautiful thing that you talk about regularly in your work is the beloved disciple, John, and how when John lays his head on Jesus' chest, he is literally, physically listening for the heartbeat of God. It's tangible, it's loving, it's beautiful, but it's a metaphor that speaks to a lot of things and something that reminds us that the way of the Celts who follow the beloved disciple as the primary disciple is a place and a, a people that really find something where God is tangible in creation as central to theology. But one of the things that you talk about is the difference in that versus what the Roman <laughs> Whether you're talking about haircuts or you're talking about the date of Easter or theology, there's a difference in the Celtic theology and the Roman theology. And most of us hear a lot about the Roman theologies and particularly the doctrines of original sin and creatio ex nihilo. I would love for you to talk to us a little bit about those things and how there's a difference and what difference that makes for us and how we can be invited into that conversation towards this listening to the heartbeat of God. Mm. Thank you, Anna. And uh, first of all, I'd, I'd like to say how, how good it is to be with you all. Thank you for inviting me. And I'm so, I'm so glad that you've started with that most cherished image, that, that memory that is referred to again and again over the centuries in the Celtic world the memory of John the Beloved leaning against Jesus and how it was said that he therefore heard the heartbeat of God and how he became a symbol of the practice of listening, um, inviting us to, to be in deep listening posture, listening to the beat of the divine in, in one another and listening for that beat of the sacred deep within ourselves and every human being, and listening within the body of the earth for the beat of the sacred. Uh, so th this is a, a practice that is cherished uh, through that sort of icon image of John leaning against Jesus. But I think it really informs the, the vision and the practice of, of, of this Celtic wisdom that that one can trace and that I try to trace in this new book from the earlier centuries right through to today. And I think one of the reasons it's very good to, to start with this image of listening is that, that that's what I, that's my prayer for us tonight, that we, that we may listen for the sacred in, in one another, that we may know that sacred presence deep within ourselves and and through this listening together, we, we can become more aware of, of the essence, that beautiful, unspeakably beautiful essence of the divine within you, within, within each one of you. And uh, to grow in an awareness that, that this is the presence that we bear for one another. Mm -hmm. Each one of us a, a unique and unrepeatable expression of the divine. And uh, my sense is that each one of us have, has been born as unique expression of the divine uh, to play a, an absolutely unique role in the well-being of the world. And um, 
and each one of us, whether in very quiet and hidden ways, um, ways that may be unnoticed by others or in much more sort of public and explicit ways, each one of us is, um, is called to be that unique expression of the divine. So <clears throat> I'm, <clears throat> I'm, I'm delighted that that, can, that, that image um, is with us from, from the very beginning tonight. And um, the distinction that you've drawn between the Celtic and the Roman, or um, I prefer often to refer to it as the Mediterranean, um, uh, so that we don't get stuck at, at any misunderstanding. This is not referring to Roman Catholicism so much as, as the sort of medieval or um, um, Mediterranean imperial tradition of Christianity. That, that began to have uh, some distinct features that, that were very different from the Celtic, uh, especially from the fourth century onwards. So when Christianity uh, got into bed with empire in the fourth century, when Christianity became the religion of empire, um, there was a, a sort of trade-off that, that happened, I believe. I mean, it was, a, it was an enormous transition in Mediterranean Christianity to go almost overnight from being a persecuted minority to being um, the religion of, of empire with status, with power, with privilege. And um, th there was a sort of trade-off. Um, yes, safety from persecution, but increasingly the religion of empire uh, was was being expected to, to teach truths that were convenient to, to the empire. And I think that there, there are two sort of primary expressions of that that happen in and around the fourth century. And the one is the doctrine of original sin. Um, I think that this was, this was um, a teaching that was convenient to empire because I really wanted to say that what is deepest in every person is opposed to God rather than being what is deepest in us being of God. Uh, and part of, of course, the Celtic tradition wanting to celebrate that what is deepest in us is, is of God uh, was to say that the wisdom of the divine is deep within each, each one of us. And um, empire doesn't really want to hear that wisdom is to be found at the heart of the people. Um, I think empire was much more inclined to want to control the people or to exploit the people or to use the people. Um, and of course, and we we're speaking about the, the Roman Empire in the fourth century, but these statements can apply to any empire, whether that's the British Empire or the American Empire, any nation that tries to exert its control over the world for its own sake, uh, operates in, in imperial mode. Um, so uh, someone like St. Augustine um, uh, was the first to really begin to give uh, full and, and um, explicit expression to what we now know as the doctrine of original sin, which was to say that what is deepest in every human being is opposed to God rather than being of God. Um, it's it's, all, it's, it's um, a teaching that, that is, I think, uh, perverted in many ways when, when we think of holding a newborn child in our arms. I mean, I, I regard the births of my four children as the most sacred moments of my life um, in their face uh, I could see something of the countenance the light from which we've all come uh, in their skin I could smell some of the freshness of God the freshness of life's origin so uh, you know one of the points I, I, I try to make in the, in the book is that these are things that we know I, I believe that we know that about the newborn child and part of the way forward, I believe, is for that deep knowing to be rekindled or, or uh, liberated, set free. 
And uh, so again and again in the Celtic tradition, the, the great teachers see themselves as releasing a wisdom that's already there uh, and inviting their listeners to, to, to live in relation to that deep knowing about the sacredness of the newborn child. And of course, when the great Celtic teachers speak about the sacredness of the newborn child, they're not just speaking about the child, uh, they're speaking about what is deepest in you um, and in every human being. Um, so uh, this has enormous Im implications um, the, to see that what is at the heart of every human being is, is, is that unspeakable beauty of the divine. It changes how we look into one another's eyes. Uh, it changes how we think about one another. Um, uh, it changes our expectation of what we will uh, be in uh, encountering the deeper we move into the true essence of, of the other. It means that um, we can see ourselves as liberators. Um, you know, I, I don't need to bring anything to you. I, need, I don't need to deposit some, some wisdom or some beauty or some creativity in you. My role is to, is to release it in you um, because you, you are made of God. And um, I, love, I love what um, Julian of Norwich, and, and, you know, in later centuries, um, and she came from that sort of Northumbrian uh, territory of Britain that was very influenced by the Celtic mission. And I love how she says, uh, we're not just made by God, uh, we are made of God. Mm -hmm. um, we're not simply fashioned from afar by a distant creator. Um, we have come out of the very womb or come out of the very essence of God, um, which is to say that, that the stuff, you know, the stuff of our being is sacred stuff. Um, so that, that was a, a major distinguishing point between the imperial uh, mission or the Mediterranean mission and the, and the Celtic mission. And it's one of the reasons why uh, some of the early Celtic teachers were uh, persecuted, uh, excommunicated by the Bishop of Rome, um, because this, this wasn't convenient to how empire wanted to operate and, and see, see the people of its own empire, but the people of every, every nation. Um, and a corollary uh, to that belief in the essential sacredness of every human being and, uh, uh, and the understanding of, of Christ uh, not embodying a, a truth or a sacredness that was foreign to us, but rather um, Christ was seen as, as coming to reveal. Um, and the word uh, revelation comes from the Latin root revelare, which just means to lift the veil. So Christ was seen as coming to lift the veil uh, to show us uh, what our essence is uh, made of God. Um, but a, a corollary of this sense uh, and, and this vision of the sacredness of every human being, the sacredness at the heart of every human being, was the belief in the sacredness of the earth and the sacredness of matter. Mm -hmm. So. Um, one of the first things that, uh, that imperial Christianity was, um, was, I think, pressured to do was to uh, utter the doctrine of creation ex nihilo, um, a doctrine that was used to teach that, that a distant creator um, fashioned matter out of nothing, ex nihilo. And uh, the Celtic teachers all along said, um, creation didn't, hasn't come out of nothing. Creation has come out of the very essence of God. And um, one of the first Celtic teachers that we know about in terms of historical record was Irenaeus of Lyon uh, in that sort of Celtic territory of ancient France. And uh, he, is the first to give articulation to a vision of the earth that is consistently expressed then and in the centuries after him. 
and uh, he says creation doesn't come out of nothing it's not fashioned out of nothing creation he says comes out of and, and, and he uses a word that is still sort of shocking to our dualistic western ears he says um, creation uh, we and all things come out of the substance mm -hmm. of, of the divine uh, which is to say that this stuff, you know, the stuff of our bodies um, is sacred stuff. So how we handle one another in relationship is a sacred matter. Uh, how we care for the physical needs of those who are hungry and homeless. Um, th this is a sacred responsibility. And, and he's also saying that the matter of the earth is sacred. So how we handle the resources of the earth with justice and with equity, um, how we how we uh, can play our part in helping the earth to heal itself at this moment of ecological crisis. These are sacred issues, um, and uh, and that was something else that empire was not wanting to hear because the way of empire, and again I'm referring to the Roman, but uh, historically, but one can see the same pattern in, in the way the British Empire has often operated or the American Empire to the extent that we've thought we can do whatever we, whatever we wish to the earth uh, for the sake of ourselves. And, um, and, and that um, deep sort of falseness of perspective that makes a division between us and the earth or between the well-being of our nation and the well-being of every nation um, is something that the Celtic teachers kept getting into trouble uh, over. And um, you might I explore eight major teachers <clears throat> in this book, plus a tradition from the Western Isles. And um, every one of those teachers got into trouble uh, mm -hmm. with the holders of power because this, this is a teaching that has radical implications for how we see one another, how we see the earth and handle the earth. There's so many thoughts that are going on in my head as you're speaking. Um, so one or two uh, that we could go down the path on. Um, I can recall a few years ago, I went to a session of clergy uh, out in California, and they were trying to teach us how to grow churches. And they were putting into our session, um, basically how to be a salesperson for God, how to sell God. Mm -hmm. And I said, at that time, I leaned over to a friend next to me and I said, I'm not a salesperson for God. I am a gift wrap specialist. <laughs> Because the deal is I can't sell you something or give you something that you already have. Yeah. You already have that divine spark in you. You already have something of infinite worth. And the best that I can do is to try to help you grow into that in some way or allow it to shine. And for me, some of my work um, was on... Uh, learning how to listen to God's self and others and develop spiritual midwifery mm -hmm. because basically God is always doing the things and our job if we're paying attention and and I love it where you talk about the ego being in service to the soul our job is not to let our own egos get so much in control that we're just trying to do the next thing to puff our own self up or to get this right but to understand that there is uh, something greater than any of our present goals there is something that is beautiful um, in humility in the moment um, and when you talk about and I'd love for you to share that a little bit you talk about a story of the golden thread and what that has meant um, to children and what it means to us and the Celtic teachers and the golden thread. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit to that 
and um, maybe expand it into how you um, have seen or interacted with that golden thread in others as you've gone along your path. You have so many stories um, about these kinds of things um, from women coming up and bringing their books to you too. I'll, I'll, there's so many. I Yes, I have paid a lot of attention to things that you have said, but I want you to share them with the people who are here um, mm -hmm. and let them in on some of the gifts of the golden thread. Yeah, the, the, uh, the image that I uh, draw on in, in the book uh, in particular relates to, to uh, a very little known uh, historical uh, character, teacher from the 19th century named Alexander John Scott. And um, I, I, did, I did my sort of PhD research on, on Alexander Scott. And I mean, he was a perfect uh, PhD candidate because no one in the world knew anything about Alexander Scott. He had been very much forgotten. So by, by day three of the research, I was the world expert. And, um, <coughs> and then sort of consolidated my position for the next three years. <clears throat> but um, the, the um, I mean, the really interesting thing about Alexander Scott was that <clears throat> he, he was not a, he was not a writer, he was a great orator. And, and he influenced people um, through, through his uttered word and through relationship, uh, rather than through many, many writings. But he, he was the one to use this image of, in the 19th century, royal garments in Britain were still woven through with a golden thread. And if the golden thread uh, were taken out of the garment, <clears throat> then the whole garment would unravel. Um, and he said, so it is with the image of the divine uh, woven into us. If somehow it were taken out of us, we, we would unravel, we would, we would cease to be. Which is to say that this uh, golden thread of the divine <clears throat> is not simply a feature of our being um, or uh, a, a golden thread that might be in uh, one person and not in another, or in one religion and not in another, or one nation and not in another, or one sexual orientation and not in another. That thread of the divine is uh, deep, deep within the fabric of every human being. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I was exploring some of these themes in, in Ottawa, in, in Canada many years ago, uh, and also focusing on those beautiful words, opening words from John's gospel, um, in, in which he speaks about the true light, the light of the divine that enlightens every person coming into the world. And I spoke of how the, the Celtic tradition saw itself as not, not somehow bearing light and depositing light into people who didn't have light, uh, but rather saw itself as, as a liberating um, force to, to set free the light that is already deep in, in the so-called other. And uh, in attendance that night in Ottawa was a Mohawk elder uh, who had been invited to to be there to make observation about some of the parallels between Celtic wisdom and uh, native wisdom or First Nations wisdom in Canada. And uh, that, I mean, the, the, the resonances are extraordinary uh, between these indigenous traditions and, and the Celtic wisdom. Uh, but at the end of the talk, uh, he stood with tears in his eyes, this beautifully strong young Mohawk elder. And he said, as I've been listening to these themes, I've been wondering where I would be tonight. And I've been wondering where my people would be tonight. And I, would, I have been wondering where we would be as a Western world tonight if the mission that had come to us from Europe centuries ago had come expecting to find light in us. Um, we can't undo the horrendous wrongs that have been done in the name of the truly humble one, Jesus. 
uh, we can't um, erase that, that history of, of perhaps the most arrogant expression of, of religion that humanity has known, conquering, uh, sort of triumphing in the name of truth. So we can't undo that, um, but we can, I believe, be part of new beginnings. And I believe that, that the posture of strength that we are being invited into is the strength of radical humility, of, um, of positioning ourselves, expressing ourselves, living our lives in terms of a reverence for what is deep within the, the other. And, uh, and I think that as we, as we imagine what a sort of rebirthing of Christianity could look like at this moment in time, I believe one of the major characteristics uh, of, of a reborn Christianity or a reborn Christian wisdom uh, would be one of radical, radical humility. Uh, and, and that is a position of strength to me, that, that is our true strength to, to uh, connect with and to live from the, uh, the sacred humus of our being, uh, of the ground of the divine that is deep within us. So much goodness in that. And I'm still thinking too about ground. And going with that for a moment, you talk about John Muir and the importance of uh, the bare feet <laughs> as connecting to God in nature, God in creation, and all of the different stories. I spent uh, almost my entire adult life in California. Hmm. And most recently, pretty close to Yosemite within a little hop there. And I can remember, um, well, I guess it was about this, almost this time last year, I went with a friend um, to a place called Mono Lake, which is near, Yos really near Yosemite. You can just see the, the mountains of Yosemite right across. Um, and there was this place called Panem Crater. And it's a volcano and it's a plug of a volcano and you can hike up to it and sit in the plug of this volcano. And so you're literally sitting on like a blood vessel of the earth, right? Like a scabbed over blood vessel. Mm. And it's so powerful. And when you look out, the wilderness is still all around you. There are so much of that land actually belongs to LA and other places or the forestry service and other things. So people aren't on it. And you can look out for miles and miles and see just expanse. Mm -hmm. So that when you're thinking about somebody like John Muir, these are not that far off from some of the things that he saw. And that land is protected in part because of his work. So I wonder um, if you will kind of go down that path um, of feeling God in nature and the importance of the connectedness of that and spirituality. I would love to hear some of your Iona stories um, because you talk about, for me, that was a thin space. Mm. Um, and it's not the only thin space. When I'm in the Redwoods, also a thin mm. space. The Sequoia is a thin space, but there are places, Sedona, a thin space, right? Mm -hmm. um, there are places around that feel like the spirit is, is just a, a special something is happening. It's like a mi magical, mystical mm -hmm. something. And so would you talk a little bit about these thin spaces, about Iona, about um, how we can be more present in those spaces um, and grow in our spirituality that way? Mm. Yeah, and uh, you, you're all very welcome to come to Iona and, and uh, experience this, not just hear about it. Um, uh, George McLeod, the founder of the modern day Iona community, and very much one of my 
most important teachers in my life. Uh, it was George MacLeod who I think was the first one to speak of Iona as, as a thin place. And by that he meant there's a sort of thin, what we experience on Iona is, is a very thin uh, tissue, thin or thin as gossamer, as he put it, um, veil between the, the heaven and earth and between the spirit and matter. And in saying that Iona uh, was a thin place, he wasn't, of course, saying that every place else is thick. Uh, he, he was recognizing that these thin places like Iona and places of pilgrimage and, and places of um, uh, much more immediate sensing of and accessing the sacred, so sort of these places where we can almost sort of reach through the veil that divides heaven from earth. Uh, these places he, he saw as uh, very importantly, sort of not, not places to uh, grasp at or try to hold or not to try to think that, well, we, we, we need to spend our whole lives on, on Iona. Uh, but rather, uh, these were places that were like sacraments uh, uh, of, of what we are being invited to see and to experience and be in touch with and serve and adore in every, in every place. So uh, Iona for someone like George McLeod, it was um, a place where our inner faculties are trained um, so that we look for that thinness everywhere. We look for it right now. In, in, one another, in one another's eyes, in one another's countenance. We expect to, um, to, to be blessed by that thinness that is everywhere present. Um, so uh, that, that, um, that's an important emphasis that we find not only in George MacLeod, but, but in all of these great teachers of Celtic wisdom over the centuries. And that is, uh, uh, allowing ourselves to, to, to be deeply renewed in places of special sacredness, special um, pilgrimage, uh, in, in order to be more deeply equipped and more deeply engaged in, in the more challenging places where it, where it is not so immediately clear that the veil is thin. Uh, I am... Um, I grew up in, in Canada and, and as a boy, uh, a lot of my, my most sacred experiences were, were in, in the wildness of, of the, the north of Ontario up in the Muskoka Lakes. And uh, interesting looking back on it, I, um, I didn't really have language to, I didn't have spiritual or theological language to, uh, ex express just how sacred those, th that landscape and those places and times were to me because I've been reared in a very um, conservative evangelical tradition and I'm, I'm very indebted uh, to, to my sort of birth in that tradition. That's it's not where I am now, but I, I honor that tradition. Um, because I think it taught me to pay attention to the heart. And I, I believe I've, I've brought that tradition, uh, that, that sort of heartfelt, uh, heart attentive um, practice uh, with me and in, into um, um, a, a broader sort of Celtic expression of our Christian inheritance. Um, but that tradition, uh, because it made, it's made such a, uh, almost a divorce between spirit and matter. Um, I didn't have the language to know that uh, these forests that, that uh, in whose presence I knew I felt well, I, I didn't have the language to see that this is the presence of the divine at the time in the midst of and, and the time being nurtured by and inspired by. Uh, so it wasn't until I um, 
began to study theology in, in Scotland when I was uh, in my early 20s, that I, uh, first of all, encountered George MacLeod. And I remember the, the first time I heard him speaking publicly. I mean, he was about 80, I was about 20. Uh, he, he was, you know, he was a great legend of a teacher. Uh, but uh, when I heard him speaking about the sacredness of the earth and uh, heard him speaking about the nonviolence of Jesus as the way of true relationship, um, I, I had this experience of, of hearing what I deeply knew at mm -hmm. some level, but had never been given theological religious language for. And uh, I remember in, in hearing him, uh, some part of me thought, um, I, I must find a way of coming close to this man. Uh, I didn't know how that was going to happen. Um, but a few months later, I, the universe uh, opened the door and I was on the island of Iona and um, met the great man. He, he was on Iona as well. And, he was very much an Edwardian gentleman um, in his upbringing and, um, and, and generation. Um, so it was a, a term of, of respect and sort of uh, friendliness to call someone by their last name. And so after a few pleasantries, he, he said, Newell, come back with me for whiskey. Uh, so back, you know, I don't think I'd ever had whiskey in my life and certainly not before five o'clock at night and uh, but you know when the great man says come back for whiskey you go back for whiskey and um, so I began to find language uh, through George MacLeod and then through the Celtic uh, inheritance I began to find language for what my experience had been as a boy and as an adolescent knowing that I, I was well when I was in the context of the wildness of nature um, and, and began to pull those, those parts of my life together. And, um, and, I, I, and the, the teachings of, of George MacLeod and then as I more and more accessed uh, Celtic teachers over the centuries, I saw that this was a lineage there was a lineage of, of thought and practice about sacredness of the earth. And then it, very importantly, um, in someone like George MacLeod, it wasn't just speaking about the sacredness of the earth, it was about acting uh, in, in relation to um, the healing of the earth. Thank you for that. And one of the things, there are several good MacLeod stories that I really liked, including the how all of these different resources in the midst of the war just ended up on the shores perfectly the right length to rebuild the <laughs> abbey so i encourage you to get the book so that you can find the funny stories from uh, from a cloud in there because it's totally worth it um but another part of the McLeod stories, which resonated with me, is um, a season of my life, a couple of different seasons of my life have been connected with Japan. Um, and one of the seasons of my life, I was pastoring a Japanese American church in Santa Maria, California. Um, and I had parishioners that in my church that were children who survived Hiroshima, the bombing of Hiroshima. And you talk about this divorce um, of spirit and matter uh, that, well, actually McLeod talks about this divorce of spirit and matter that happened, um, I think, was it the Feast of the Transfiguration was that day, um, that on the day that they bombed Hiroshima. And here we have done, you know, that's one major extreme example, but certainly, um, I feel like you would ag agree with some, some part of the statement, if not the whole thing. Um, every time that we do things that are against um, the love of nature, we are continuing to do harm to the very face of God. Um, and so here we are trying to uh, reform <laughs> um, and, and you, I can't remember right now the quote, oh, you talk about grace and nature and how things are reformed um, 
through grace, the act of grace, uh, but that's sin. So maybe you can talk a little bit about sin and grace and uh, reformation um, and lead into, I don't want to script this for you, but at the same time, um, and lead into um, salvation. And what does that mean to heal the world? Um, the Jews would talk about tikkun olam as part of that, um, the restoration of the world. But certainly we, um, we have all of these things because um, we come out of the Jewish tradition because Jesus was a Jew. <laughs> um, and so here we are um, trying to figure out, you know, how do we do this right now? How do we heal the world if we are going to be in this tradition where we do see goodness um, instead of evil as the fundamental nature of things, right? Mm. So yeah. can you think about that for a little bit? Yeah, my goodness, big questions. Um, uh, I think, first of all, it, it's really important to, to spend a bit of time with the understanding of nature and grace that comes across in, in, the, in this Celtic stream of wisdom. Uh, because in so much of our Western Christian inheritance, which was so influenced by the Mediterranean or by the imperial stream and the sort of creedal statements and so on of the fourth century that have so dominated Western Christian thought. Uh, in, in so much of that Western Christian inheritance, we saw grace and nature uh, in opposition. So and grace is given to, to, in a sense, free us from our nature. Mm -hmm. Grace is given somehow that we might become something more than, than natural uh, or other uh, than, than what is at the heart of nature. And again, they sort of, um, the, the Western tradition got very stuck with this sense of original sin, that what is deepest in our nature is opposed to God. So uh, the understanding that comes across in, in the Celtic stream is that both nature and grace are of God and um, that uh, the gift of nature, as one of the great teachers, John Scottus Ariagina said, he said, um, the gift of nature is, is the gift of, of being. Um, that, and, and our being is sacred. The gift of grace, he said, is the gift of well-being. So uh, grace is given not in opposition to our nature, but grace is given to reconnect us to the true essence, or to the true heart of our nature, which is of God, made of God. So uh, we're not given grace to become something other than ourselves. Uh, we're given grace to become truly ourselves, uh, to truly connect with that well source of the divine that is deep within us. That has enormous implications for how we view ourselves, uh, how we view others, how we view uh, the, the wisdom of, of other spiritual traditions, um, that, that they, they are bearers of the sacred gift of nature. And they have also um, uh, celebrated spiritual practices and, and ways of seeing that are about releasing what is deep within us. A number of years ago, uh, I was giving, giving um, some talks in Virginia. And uh, as part of my visit to Richmond, Virginia, uh, an interfaith, interspiritual, dialogue occurred and so I was there with a rabbi and with an imam and I was there as the Christian teacher. Uh, sounds like the beginning of a joke doesn't it? There was the rabbi and the imam and the, and the Christian teacher and um, at one point uh, the, the evening was, was sort of opened up for people to make comments and questions and someone asked if we would speak about the the doctrine of original sin. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, th this is a Christian problem. This is not a Jewish problem. It's not a Muslim problem. Mm -hmm. um, those traditions are very clear that we are made in the image of God um, and, uh, and that what is at the heart of our being is of God. So um, 
it, it's a, it's a Christian theological problem. It's not a Jewish or Muslim problem. But it was the rabbi who was the first to respond, and he said, to, "He said original sin." Um, he said that to most Jews would mean that was a really original sin. That was a really creative, sin. <laughs> really creative sin. Um, and uh, so at, at that point, I, I thought, thank God for interfaith dialogue. I mean, here, here this rabbi That's awesome. yeah. had, had a room full of primarily Christians laughing about this absurd um, doctrine of original sin. Um, so uh, getting back to the sort of relationship between nature and grace, so grace is given to set free um, what is at the very heart of our nature. So the, um, the sort of confluence of, of nature and grace within us. And um, sin um, in the Celtic world, uh, it, it was my teacher, George McLeod, who very so helpfully um, uh, reminded us that the, the English word sin comes from the um, uh, middle uh, uh, high German uh, word sunda, S-U-N-D-A, uh, which means to sunder. And so uh, sinning is about sundering. It's about uh, ripping apart uh, my essence from your essence or the heart of our being from the, the heart of another nation's being or it's about sundering or severing the relationship between uh, humanity and, and the rest of the earth and the other species of the earth. It's about severing or sundering a true uh, relationship of honoring um, between one people and, and another. So um, we, we have been part of a lot of sundering, mm -hmm. um, sundering between our religion and other religions, between our nation and other nations, between the human species and other, Earth's other species. And uh, the, the journey through uh, that, um, sundering that, that we've been part of. We are given grace to um, someone like Pelagius in the fourth century, speaks about three different types of grace. And one he says is the grace of, the grace of nature, um, which is to say that everything is grace. Um, our breath, um, the rising of the sun, the birth of our children, um, this moment, it's all, it's all essentially gift. You know, we haven't, we haven't somehow earned this or created this. This is just pure, pure gift. Um, and the other uh, second form of grace that he refers to is the grace of illumination. When the eyes of our heart, he says, are washed uh, and we see again uh, the, the sacredness of the heart of one another and the heart of all life. And the third, he says, is the grace of forgiveness. So when we have sundered, when we've been part of sundering, when I have betrayed you or been untrue to the heart of your being, and, and in that sense, sundered or violated the tie, the essential bond between us and all things, um, the grace of forgiveness is given that we may live again from our true essence from our true stature made and dignity made of God. Um, so re redemption is about um, reconnecting, um, the restoring as uh, if I may sort of borrow the lucidity of a great Jewish teacher to in fact uh, um, paraphrase what I think the Celtic tradition is saying, Martin Buber, says it speaks about re redemption as the restoration of betweenness it's the it's the bringing back mm -hmm. into relationship uh, what belongs in, in 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 union or or in reverence um so 
salvation, the, the other aspect of salvation that, that, um, that I find so important in the stream of Celtic wisdom is the word salvation is derived in part from the word salve or salve, uh, as I believe you would also pronounce it. So it, it's to do with the salve or this uh, oil or this healing ointment. So uh, we are all being called to be part of sal of bringing salve, bringing healing, um, um, being part of this holy work of, of, of the restoration of betweenness. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that a little bit in terms of uh, we have touched on um, dualism and uh, non-dualism, you have now brought in the tri-faith, you talked about an imam, a rabbi, and a, a Christian, and actually um, there used to be a series, um, <laughs> more than a joke, I think was the name of it, um, which was the imam, the rabbi, and, <laughs> and the Christian pastor, prior to my time here, they actually had a series that that was the title of it, um, right. and so you're speaking our language in this respect. Um, and Alexander John Scott, um, when I was reading your book, was really fluid, um, uh, fluent and fluid, I guess, in learning how to integrate in this non-dualistic way, all of these different learnings, because there is a truth that is beyond the tradition, right? Something that resonates deeply within me and deeply within you and deeply within other tradition. And we start to hear the divine yeah. and when we go and we sit with people um, because there's, there are those golden threads that resonate uh, one with another. And we, when we can find them, then we start building unity in the world. So what would be your invitation in speaking to this tri-faith kind of group, what would be your wisdom, challenge, or thoughts on how that, from a Celtic perspective, um, not just the importance of that, nonviolent peace building, obviously, is something you've already started to on the path of, um, but also in terms of how to bring us towards unity, what are those pieces that can help us um, to go to the next level in how we interact with one another. Hmm. Well, I, I, I would like to speak, um, you know, about my own journey on, on this front, um, because I, th I think that sort of my spirituality of, of interfaith um, or interspiritual relationship is, is based very much on, on the gift of relationship. Uh, that I've had with teachers from, from other great traditions. Uh, these relationships have shaped me deeply. And um, I, I spoke earlier about my inheritance of, of quite a heartfelt Christian piety that, that came from a, from a very conservative evangelical tradition. And um, I, I realized a number of years ago that, that in interspiritual, interfaith contexts, what I am first and foremost doing um, is paying attention to the heart of the other. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, with my, my, I mean, I have one rabbi who is so close that, that I refer to him as my brother. Um, and, and this perplexes many, many people. They wonder how um, um, my Scottish mother gave birth to a rabbi and a, <laughs> and, and, a, and a Christian teacher. But I mean, I mean he, he is a, a truly a brother of my heart. And, um, and in and through him and, and um, Muslim teachers and native teachers, especially, and some, some Hindu and Buddhist teachers, uh, I, I have... Uh, the way of relationship for me uh, is, is that when Rabbi Nachum teaches 
Torah, I mean, when he leads me and others in Torah study, he, um, he deepens my, my devotion to the Christ mystery at the heart of my being and uh, the, that light at the heart of every human being. I mean, how do, how do we do that? I mean, you know, we've been, we've been trained and, and are told in some ways, culturally and religiously, that these traditions are, are somehow in competition or, <laughs> or opposed to one another, mm -hmm. rather than uh, given to somehow complete one another. So, I, uh, so it's not about competing, it's about completing uh, mm -hmm. one another. And that's been my experience. Um, you know, Nachum feeds my my soul, and and uh, he doesn't. And that feeding it doesn't somehow lead me to want to abandon my tradition. It doesn't make me want to convert to Judaism. Uh, it it uh, it feeds me in in a way that I think deepens my my own desire to be true to the wisdom of Jesus. And, um, and I, I know also from someone like Rabbi Nachum that uh, what he wants to hear from me is not some sort of stripped down common ground spirituality. He wants to hear from me about my perceptions of of the wisdom of Jesus. And uh, that's what he looks to me uh, for. And uh, so the, these experiences, these sort of the grace of, of relationship uh, with, with, with other men and women from, from the other great traditions uh, is what's really informed um, my perspective. But I think I was well, uh, I was well um, equipped by the Celtic tradition to, to look with great sort of readiness uh, to the wisdom of other traditions. And, and, and that's, been a, that's been a blessing and, and it, it's one of the ways in which I, I have um, believed that interspiritual interfaith relationship can be nurtured by some of the wisdom of the Celtic tradition. And um, this is not to say that we, we all need to become Celts, that we all need this sort of Celtic wisdom. You know, that's just yet another form of fundamentalism to start going down that path. It's to say that I think this, the Celtic stream holds some important wisdom for us today um, in relation to the earth and in relation to, to uh, in, interfaith relationship. And, and these are critical issues today. My goodness, they are issues very close to the heart of this moment in time. How will we, how do we relate with earth? How do we relate to, to other great religious traditions? Um, we're getting pretty close to the heart of the, of the holy work of healing if we, can, um, if we can move the world an inch in the right direction, as Martin Buber said. Well, or as your own questions become, what are we going to do about it? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> this this is this is the lead in. Um, but we've we've gone back and forth and back and forth a lot um, about some of the, the questions um, which I was hoping would illustrate some of this theology um, and stories that you have so graciously written about um, in your books. And this one is beautifully written from uh, Pelagius on. Uh, to Kenneth White. Um, and so it's a gift to us that we can look at this um, and really think differently a little bit from the main teachings a lot of people have been have been taught, which of course history is written by the winners, right? Um, and so you have to do a little bit of searching to hear the rest of the story. And I want to thank you for doing that searching uh, and for giving us um, some more pieces that will enliven the light within us um, in some ways that hopefully will help us to have new verve towards healing ourselves and healing the world around us. Um, yeah, if I, if I may just say Anna, um, very briefly about Kenneth White, because that's a name that, that I expect 
most people haven't heard about, even most people in Scotland have, have not um, known about Kenneth White, who I think is one of the greatest um, poets of, of the English language. Um, and he's from Scotland and, and hardly anyone knows about him in Scotland. Um, one of the reasons why I finished the book with the chapter on Kenneth White is not just because he, he sounds many of the, the themes that have been expressed by great Celtic teachers before him, um, but because in someone like Kenneth White, I think um, there's the sense of, of journey rather than knowing exactly what the destination is. Um, and I, I think Kenneth, in, in, to that extent, um, represents the journey for many people in a type of spiritual exile at this moment in time. So many people are realizing that they're yearning for, for more than what our Western Christian traditions have, have, um, have been offering us in terms of vision of the earth or vision of, of, uh, of what is deepest in, in us and all people. Um, and in this time of searching, I, I think we're uh, so, someone like Kenneth White for me is an icon of, of journeying and being willing at this stage to, in a sense, set sail um, with, with uh, our um, hearts very, very focused on, on what we're yearning for and to pay attention to those yearnings as part of what will guide us on, on the journey. Um, so it's, it, I think that's one of the beautiful things for me about this stream of Celtic wisdom. And it sort of leads us, it leads us back in our conversation to where we began. And that's about listening for the beat of the sacred, uh, deep at the heart of this moment, um, uh, deep within one another, deep in, in ourselves. And uh, the, the important thing is, is to um, pay attention to this, yearning to listen, um, not because we know exactly what we're going to hear or exactly where it's going to take us, uh, uh, but, you know, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It's the conviction of things not yet seen. We, we, we don't know exactly how, how devotion to the Christ mystery is going to play out at this moment in time. Um, and, and it's okay to, to not know. Uh, and, and I think that that's one of the reasons I wanted Kenneth in the book. Say that again. It's okay to not know. <laughs> I yeah. think I get stuck on that one a lot. Um, and I don't think I'm alone. Yeah. I don't like the not knowing. And yet I know that those liminal spaces, which you talk about with Bridget, those liminal spaces are the spaces of midwifery. They are the spaces where God is doing a thing. The mm -hmm. spaces of the known, it doesn't take any faith to know something that's already right in front of your face. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it takes a whole lot of faith to, to not know what's going to happen next and to trust the journey. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's the, you know, it, for me, it's the, it's the nature of true relationship. Um, it's about trusting the, in love, trusting the essence of the other. And, and that's not, not to know exactly where you're going to go together. It's, 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 to, um, it, it's to focus on an attentiveness and a readiness to imagine. I mean, to be made of God is to be made of, is to be made of the imaginer. Uh, I love what Thomas Berry says about the universe. You know, he says, it's so amazing. It must have been dreamt into being. Um, and then he goes on to say, and we are in such a mess, ecologically, religiously, politically, culturally, we're in such a mess. He says, we need to dream the way forward. We need to allow ourselves through the sacred gift of the imagination to imagine uh, ways of seeing, ways of relating, uh, ways of living that, that we haven't known anything of before. And, and um, that, that's why one of the chapters in the new book is on the sacred imagination. I, I think uh, this is a gift that, that we should be praying for and seeking and trying to release um, a further employing of the faculty of the imagination. Mm -hmm. And knowing when 
when to journey and when to let go and when to hold fast. This is a growth area (laughs) for I think most of us. Um, And yet God gives us imagination um, through ourselves, through other things um, and having trust uh, that when you let go, God hasn't let go of you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, There's um, John Scott Osario Eugenia, this ninth century teacher, um, loves to play with words. And one of the words he plays with is the Greek word for God, which is theos. And he says it's derived from the Greek verb theo, which means to flow. Uh, so he says, God is the flow. Go uh, with the God flow. Deep within all things. And then Kenneth White, the poet, uh, says, God is not only the flow, God is the glow flow. Uh, and um, and I like to build on Erigina and Kenneth White by saying, God is not only the flow, uh, but God is the glow flow. And we need to let go to the glow flow. <laughs> I like that one. I'm yeah. going to permanently borrow that. Okay, you can have it. Yeah. Um, so I know oftentimes um, one of uh, one of the things that after we've talked and talked about something, although I would love to talk with you for the rest of the night, I realize that time is limited. Um, one of the things that we do is moving from the heart, of uh, move from the head to the heart. Yeah. Is there a way that you would um, invite us to transition into a heart space? Yeah, well, uh, that's that's one of the um, one of the reasons why, w- when I'm teaching, I so often move uh, from presentation to into a simple chant or a simple meditative practice uh, to to enable that sort of equipoise between head and heart. I think that's one of the most creative places to be uh, is in that meeting place uh, within us, but between the head and, and the heart. And I think one of the ways to, to do that very simply is to, at, at this point in our time together, to, to take um, just a moment to, in silence, Pay attention to what's stirring. I mean, what what has what from this conversation and the themes that we've been exploring? What is catching our deeper inner attention now? And um, what's beckoning to us from within? And maybe uh, to begin to to journal some of that or put it into the chat function or or, um, sometimes one of the beautiful things about journaling or just immediately trying to write something is that um, I find it important not to not to think it through um, in a sense before we start writing but just so allow our hands almost to, to start um, to be available to what's stirring us um, and, the, and, and also to know that there are no rights and wrongs about what is stirring us. I think we've lived often in a pretty inhibited religious context in which we feel we need to get our doctrine right or get, you know, say things that, that have sort of fit neatly into orthodoxy. And um, let's just tr- let's trust that um, that questions, stirrings uh, coming up are are coming essentially from that from that holy place within us that um, that we're longing to reconnect to. If anyone would like to 
share um, or have a, or has a question, um, please you can put something in the chat and I will share it. People are thinking, you've given them a lot to think about. Would, uh, Mark, you're asking about would we elaborate on that sensation or experience? And I'm not sure which sensation experience are you talking about? Iona? Is that because that was the previous question? Or are you talking about something else? Iona, would you elaborate? <laughs> okay, we'll be here for a little while longer because um, <laughs> he can elaborate on it. it. Yes, I haven't been to Iona yet. It's one of the dreams of my life is to go there. And so hopefully um, when we can get back going places, um, that can be something uh, that I, I do um, in the near future. Yeah, I hope you, I hope you will. And uh, why don't you come together from from countryside? Um, so uh, maybe I could uh, describe a little bit about what we do on our <clears throat> Iona pilgrimage weeks, and uh, just to give you a sense of how my forty plus year relationship with that island has unfolded. So um, at least four times a year. Uh, we have international pilgrimage weeks on Iona that I, I, I get to, to lead. Um, I mean, what, you know, some, uh, people often say, um, you know, when are you going to retire? When are you going to sort of stop your, your work? And I think I'll be shuffling on to Iona to lead pilgrimage weeks <laughs> as long as I have breath. So, I, you know, I... I'm uh, tempted to let go of many things, but not not those Iona weeks. It's, it is an extraordinary place. Um, Iona appears to have been a holy island long before uh, the mission of Columba in the sixth century. So it appears to have been a pre-Christian holy site, uh, which is so typical of, of the Celtic mission that, that it would not uh, ignore uh, or somehow try to conquer or take over, but, but deeply respect a, a sacred place. And Columba, for instance, in the sixth century refers to Christ as his druid, um, which, which is a way of, of reverencing the druidic wisdom that, that preceded Christianity. So it's been this place of pilgrimage um, since before the sixth century. <clears throat> and um, I think that part of the uh, uh, one of the rules in in Columbus community life in the sixth century uh, was pray until the tears come, pray until the tears come. Uh, and I think that one of and I think that 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 rule of his community has has sort of left a legacy. Uh, for Iona, it is a place of tears. Uh, uh, I have met so many people over, over the decades who say that when they stepped onto the island, they, they began to weep, um, something began to flow in them. And uh, Carl Jung says, when we weep, something in the salt sea of life's origins is stirring in us again. So, you know, we're, we're flowing again from from a deep level. And, um, but you know, that's not everyone's experience. Sometimes it's much, much later into a pilgrimage week uh, of, of study and spiritual practice and community life that there's a, a deep stirring comes. But um, it, it is very much that, that combination. So we always have some teaching sort of addressing the mind about ways ways of seeing, particularly from the Celtic wisdom. Uh, we always accompany 
that study and that uh, spiritual learning with spiritual practice, so times of meditation, times of simple spiritual rituals together. We always begin our day uh, with a half hour of silence in, in the uh, 12th century uh, chapel of Michael. And uh, that, that's, I mean, what a beautiful way to begin the day. And it is it's the way I begin every day. Um, and, and it's often on my own. But to do that together, uh, you know, with a group of 40 people uh, on Iona at this time of year, you know, sort of as the sun is beginning to rise um, over the, the hills of Mull and over the sound of Iona. Um, and uh, we always make sure that there's a lot of time to wander the island and because the island itself um, is part of that thinness that uh, George McLeod spoke about. Um, so that the uh, receiving the blessing of earth, uh, earth, sea, and sky, what the, what the Celts often refer to as the cathedral of earth, sea, and sky. I mean, that, that's the real cathedral and what, what happens in our church sanctuaries and so on should just be seen as side chapels onto the, onto the great cathedral because that's the living, uh, unfolding um, expression of, of, of the divine and the universe. Um, and, and then there, there are these uh, sharing of meals together and often some really important conversations happen over a table. Um, uh, so it, it's those many, many components of, of Iona. Uh, an Irish priest friend of mine has said that Iona has about it some something of the freshness of the first day of creation. Mm. And um, I think that's a beautiful way of putting it. And it is a beautifully pure place. It, you know, it's the Atlantic air coming in off the ocean. And, and it's a wild place. And, you know, that sort of leads, leads us back to the themes of someone like John Muir, um, that, uh, that for someone like Muir, uh, the sacred is wild, um, and and it's important to get in touch with that wild sacred depth within us, that depth, that dimension of us that can't be controlled. Um, it's uh, it's because it's of God, it's untamable, and uh, to not primarily be frightened of that, but but to to honor it, like we reverence the the wildness of of the elements. Um, and so there's something about allowing the, the wildness of, of sea and sky on Iona to, to re release some of that inner wildness of the divine with, within us. Um, and part of that is sort of getting back in touch with the childlike and, and the, the child naturally knows um, some of that wild expression. Uh, of the divine, so that's a little we taste. But you do primarily. You need to come and <laughs> come and experience it. A we taste. I like it. Um, Judy Weibel has shared um, that she thinks of herself as retired, which she is. But there is a deep sense in her that there is more, more calling, more sending, more growing, more caring and deeper being. And this reminds me of a reflection that I learned um, actually in seminary 20 years ago, how with theology and with the sort of the purpose <clears throat> of how we understand God, how we relate to the world, um, even as our bodies are challenged physically over the many years, our souls, as our bodies kind of shift into maybe not being able to do all the things if we do our work our souls actually are doing beautifully the opposite they're yeah. growing and expanding and um, we become deeper and richer um, hopefully more authentic and sincere with time yeah yeah and um, I mean that uh, those themes are, are very much echoed in in one of our great first Celtic teachers, Pelagius, um, he has this sense of, 
of the stages of life and, and how the letting go of certain types of busyness and responsibilities um, can in fact be the season for, for uh, accessing the soul in, in, in more contemplative uh, ways. But also, I think at, at every season or stage of life, to, to know that we're that we're in interrelationship, that, that we're, um, we're being invited to, to live the, the season of life that we're in for the well-being of one, one another. And, uh, and I, I love this. I love it when I see communities um, not simply reflecting the, the, the wider culture of, oh, you know, that, that person's retired, that person's sort of finished now uh, in terms of what they have to offer. And I think one of the, one of the, the things that the community of faith and spiritual community can do is to deeply honor and cherish all these seasons of life mm -hmm. and to see that the, uh, the, the, the season of retirement can, can be this time of uh, nurturing uh, and, and further releasing wisdom of soul uh, that can beautifully flow through, both through uh, a combination of, of attentiveness, but also the, the journey and the experiences uh, that, that we can bring to that attentiveness. Indeed. And I'm thinking even now of people like John Cobb or Marjorie Suhaki, who I've had an opportunity through my seminary studies to, to get to know who seem to be <laughs> just continuing on and on um, yeah. to be a blessing. Um, yeah. And they're not, they're not wasting a minute. They're, they're yeah. just going and growing and doing amazing things, ecological yeah. things or teaching things. Yeah. And as you say, um, you'll be shuffling around Diana um, until you can shuffle no more. And I think yeah. that's a very so. beautiful thing. Um, and I hope that I will get a chance to be there with you sooner rather than later so that you might shuffle uh, alongside me. Um, yeah, and uh, that would uh, be a good thing. When we were doing a, a reflection at the end of a pilgrimage on Iona a couple of years ago, one of the uh, pilgrims uh, confessed uh, to to uh, to what she had thought before coming to Iona. She said, "I thought John Philip Newell died a long time ago." Oh no! <laughs> she, she thought she was coming to a, a pilgrimage in which the writings of John Philip Newell would be. <laughs> Well, and this is this reminds me of the story. I'm trying to remember who's great. Oh, it was Dar De Chardin. Um, his his grave and the way that somebody was wanting to get it. They loved him so much that they wanted to get right in the grave with him and give him a hug. And you said, no, no, <laughs> I'm okay just getting a glass of Bordeaux <laughs> and, and toasting to the okay. <laughs> um, And so, I laughed out loud when I read that. Um, and so thank you for the, the humor. Thank you for the way that you have engaged in this conversation. Um, it has been a true joy to be able to, to speak with you. Good to be with you all. Um, and so uh, this, if you have friends that have missed this conversation, um, we will have this up for other people um, as soon as we can get it to the appropriate person on the staff to get it up there. Um, and just deep gratitude. Mm. You for your work and for your willingness to engage with us and i like i said i i hope that um i slash others at here uh get an opportunity to see you in person and sometime in the near future i look forward um, to that thank you blessings, blessings to you all